Great. We're doing good. Great. We're getting through right. everything. Oh my God. Oh my God. Craziness. So what are we talking about today? Well, Alex is going to get us started at least in just a few minutes. We're just talking about business in this environment. So. Hi guys. It's Bonnie. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Bonnie. How are you, Luann? Hi, Alex. Hi. Awesome. Well, I think we should go ahead and get started just to maximize our time with Luann. Um, welcome, everybody. It's so good to see your faces here. Um, thanks for joining us. My name is Elise Kirsch, for those that I don't know on here um, from across the country, but I'm, I'm one of the designer engagement leaders at Monogram. So we just want to thank y'all for jumping on, spending your lunch hour with us today. Um, most importantly, I'm super excited to welcome Luann. Um, I know pretty much all of y'all know her through her podcast, A Well-Designed Business, but she's so graciously offered to join our community today um, just to give you um, actionable steps, insights um, that we can all adopt in our businesses to overcome kind of this sudden crisis. So thank you for sending in your questions. There's so many good talking points. Um, we want to make this as relaxed as possible. So send in the chat any of your comments or questions, maybe that you didn't have the chance to email in. Um, we will get those to those at the end if there's any extra time. Um, and then two last kind of housekeeping things real fast. Um, we've muted all of the phones just so we can hear Luann the best. Um, so send in um, any questions you have via chat. And then we are recording this session. And so um, we will send it out later this afternoon, but no, don't feel like you have to jot down any answers or anything like that because you will have this that we'll be able to send over. So um, with that, Luann, let's jump right in. All righty, let's just give Alex a reminder to hit record. <laughs> I know I need that backup when I'm the one running the show. I'm like, ah, 20 minutes later. <laughs> exactly. All righty. All right, well, first question. Um, so this is from a company that has been in business for about two years, but they said, do you agree that this crisis is going to create a dramatic change in our industry? Um, not just now, but even after it's over. 100 and million percent. Yes. I mean, look what we're doing here, right? Would we have done this otherwise? There's been webinars, but prior to this, wasn't a webinar something like, all right, if I've got absolutely nothing else to do, you know, that one looks kind of interesting. And now it is become, you know, it's not only right now, it's our lifeline to each other and to information that we need so desperately during this time. But I think, you know, I mean, I've, this has only been two weeks in New Jersey that we've been on lockdown. And I think this is like the third or fourth webinar I've been on. And so it's sort of like, why not do it this way? Why not have, you know, 200 people with us at one time? And so I do think that companies like Monogram, who are providing this platform for their interior design partners, are going to realize that there are more ways to do this. And then also from our direct business standpoint, so many interior designers and even us at Window Works are leaning into doing the virtual tours, the virtual home tours. We were, um, you know, if you listen to the show, you know that I'm a part of Exciting Windows, which is a network of uh, window treatment professionals across the country. And we meet once a month like this to, we've been doing it for years. This is the thing, meet uh, once a month to to share ideas and to um, help each other because I'm talking to a guy in California who runs the same kind of business as I am. We're not competition for each other. And yesterday, now we're meeting twice a month because of uh, what's going on. And yesterday, two of the women were sharing that one of them had nine virtual window treatment consultations last week and closed five of them. And she said, I don't think I'm gonna go back to the other way. <laughs> like if I don't have to, you know, so, you know, there's go for window treatment and for designers, there's going to have to be that element of in the home. You finally need your accurate measurements and so forth. But I do, you know, the question is, do I think this is going to change business for good? The answer is I say yes, you know, positively and negatively, but I do think there'll be a lot of positive things that will come out of it too. And there always is, right? So it's an extension to that. It says, what do you envision being the most dramatic change being 
I feel like you kind of answered that a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but anything else that you would add with? Yeah, I, I think that it is, it's going to be that. It's going to be that um, opportunity to, to figure out ways. Right now, we're forced to figure out ways to do things virtually, right, from a, from a revenue generating standpoint. This is fun. This is great. This is information gathering. But for our businesses, we're forced to figure out how to generate revenue and get the ball rolling virtually. So um, I think the mission now for each of us as business owners is to really explore that. What are the ways that you can do it? How far can you take the um, sales process before you have to be in the house? Um, and um, so I just think that that's our, your, your job now is to start thinking out of the box. And then I think it'll be a combination of utilizing that at, you know, the virtual opportunities as well as the in-person opportunities going forward. That's good. It's really good. Kind of that creativity aspect. Yeah. So what pivot would you most highly recommend businesses focus their energy on right now? Would it be like marketing or would it be sales or? Uh, you, you, you know, look, you cannot stop marketing. You cannot. I had someone ask me recently, you know, should I continue to market in this environment? Yes. The answer is yes. Okay. Um, now it has to be done with taste. It has to be done with tact. It has to be done respectfully. Um, but it has to be done because here's the thing. This is going to end. It's going to end. I don't have a crystal ball. It's going to end in two months or six months. I, I, I don't, or two years. I don't have a crystal ball, but it's going to end. And when it ends, your potential client needs to know who's still standing, needs to know who they believe in, needs to know who did they feel like was a leader or a voice or um, just an inspiration through this crisis. And so you want to be top of mind. And so, yes, you must continue to market your business. You have to do it. Some of the ways that you were doing it are perfectly fine to continue. Other ways you're going to have to challenge yourself again to think out of the box. But, um, to not, and the crazy thing is, is, you know, there's so much marketing that can be done now with that really only costs time and not money, you know, through Facebook and Instagram and things like that, where two months ago, you know, I was the first one to complain about social, social media, my God, like, you know, like I, you got to do it. Like I used to always say on the podcast, it used to be when I wanted to track consumers to window works, I could put an ad in the star ledger and wait for my phone to ring. And now I'm like, I got to do a Facebook post and I got to pay a social media person and I got to comment and I got to make a Facebook live. Now, thank goodness there is all that. Right. So, you know, where you didn't have time before, to possibly lean into your quote unquote free avenues of marketing like Facebook lives and Facebook coffee chats and Instagram stories and all of that. If you got time on your hands, lean in now and create a name and awareness for yourself. So when this, you know, the dust settles, those potential consumers are like, I remember, you know, that kitchen and bath specialist because she shared with me a gabillion tips all the way through the crisis. I like her. I feel like I know her. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for, for kitchen and bath specialists, we were just talking about how everybody's in their kitchen cooking, right? So the marketing now, it isn't, it isn't necessarily, hi, I'm a kitchen and bath designer. I can design your kitchen. It's, hi, I'm a kitchen and bath designer, and I would like to every week show you some of my favorite features in my monogram kitchen. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then cook something. Like that lady you're talking about, Ina was, make, Ina was making, you know, Mar you know Cosmos serve them. They're at home. They're looking for connection, content, or whatever, but filter it through your superpower. So if, if, if you've had the, the ability to design your own kitchen, and if you've designed it to a way that you're just like, everything in this kitchen works for me as a cook, then every week share a tip on why I love this feature, why I love the, you know, the wall spout with the, the pot filler, like whatever it is, right? Get creative, meet them where they are and give to them. Okay. But you have time now and that doesn't cost anything but time. That's good. So the, the company who asked that question has their, you know, gross annual revenues about $500,000 in design fees. How would what you focus on vary between if you're about $500,000 in revenue, maybe you're just starting out and it's less than that, um, it could be more. Would you shift your or pivot what to focus your energy on based upon your revenue? 
Um, well, I, I have to say, I don't care if you did 50,000 last year or you did 3 million last year, you, you, you have to keep marketing. So that's the tip of the day. Okay. Write it down, keep marketing. Okay. Um, but the difference between a startup firm that might have had um, five figures last year, as opposed to somebody that's doing half a million, maybe the difference is, is that half million dollar firm, have they kept their employees? Right. And so what, how can they, you know, an employee that might have been a design assistant or might have been a project manager, you know, does that particular employee have any other skill sets that you can justify keeping them on salary, but put them to work in other ways? So for example, at Windowworks, my primary business, um, you know, I've got four installers with eyeballs looking at me every single day in a Zoom meeting. You know, they can install. My three salespeople, it's like, yeah, okay, what, what projects did you have in the pipeline before this happened? And can you close them down? And what kind of past projects were cold? Could you possibly um, warm up again and pull them through the sales process? But what am I doing with installers? Well, you know what? We've put the installers on different things. So um, we had the installers identifying, the four of them each took two counties in New Jersey and literally researched the um, every single townhouse and condominium development in those counties. And then, you know, my one installer, I'm like, okay, how are you with Google spreadsheets? He's like, I'm good. I'm like, great. So now he's making the spreadsheet, you know, putting all of the name by county, the name of the development, they, the installers are taking the next step of researching to get the phone number for the property manager or the, the development company that manages it. And then ultimately in a five or six, eight day period, they're going to pass this to the sales team who the sales team is going to start all the phone calls, right? Because here's the thing, we're going to be home probably most of this summer. And if people are home and their patios are hot as heck, they're going to need an awning and I can measure an awning and I can install an awning without coming in contact with you. So we're leaning into the one product that we have that we can possibly, you know, pull the sit through the sales process. But I've utilized installers to, to do this grunt work. So that would be a pivot. If you're a 500,000 uh, company or more and you're committed to keeping your team, then don't just say, well, that's a design assistant. You know, there's nothing for her to design. People have other superpowers and other talents. And by the way, you can just push them out of their box and figure out what they can do. That's good. And um, so this question is, recessions are a time to invest. What aspects of business would you recommend investing in during this time? So this is also um, a, a question that will depend on your financial health at present. Right. So if you are a larger company with assets, financial assets, with liquid assets, I will share with you like when we hit the 2008 recession, okay, um, not in the throes, not in that October of 2008, but that spring when it started to, you know, come through and get better again in 2009, um, it wasn't behind us but I pressed my husband to let me completely redesign our showroom. Because at that point, the showroom what had not been um, updated and I wanna say about 10 or 11 years. And I remember him saying, no, 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 we're, we're not out of the woods yet. You know, we're still being conservative with our money and this and that and the other thing. And I said to him, no, 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 no. So we got to get real with these numbers because if there's some dollar bills to do this, I want to do this. And he said, why? And I said, because another seven or eight months, this is going to fully feel like the weight of the world has lifted off the shoulders. People are going to come out of the woodwork and new window treatment companies are going to open. It's one of the best times to open a business is right when the recession is ending. And I said, and I'll be darn if we will have been a business at 30 years at that point, and we're going to look like the old lady with the shade shop on the block. When some new kid opens up with some white and gray showroom and it's all pretty, uh-uh. I said, so we got to be first. We are, this is our town. This is our community. This is our territory. I said, you know, I'm begging you to 
appropriate some monies for me to do this. And so we did. So, but, you know, that was a 30 year company and we had come through the recession good. So if you are a more mature company, or even if you're just financially solvent, Maybe you don't have a studio. Maybe that's not the investment. But do think about the things that would be really super to have to set yourself apart and differentiate yourself from your area competition. And then don't go hog wild. You know what I mean? But think about it and plan and dream. And maybe you maybe you don't start it today but you have it on your radar. And then if you're a smaller company with less you know, uh, solvency or just less resources, again, just, you, you, you can't, I want you to think about when it's over, right? There's lots to do now, but it will be over. And will you be standing? Because a lot of companies won't be standing when this is over. So you got to put it on your radar that I'm going to be a company that survives this. And when I survive it, what does my company look like? What, what can be my claim? What can be my differentiator? And then whatever financial, whatever you, whatever you can handle as it goes along financially, work towards it. But start with clarifying what it is, right? Yeah. That's good. So this shifts... Um direction a little bit, but this designer had asked, please speak to the idea of using the SBA disaster relief loans or economic harm versus credit lines or cash right now. <clears throat> Definitely apply. Definitely apply. Um, if you qualify, apply. <clears throat> I don't care if you have 100K in the bank, apply, okay? Because <clears throat> you don't have to use it. And we don't know how long this is going to last. And this is never going to, you know, this has never happened in our country before that the government has, you know, mobilized and made stuff like this available to us as small business owners. So my feeling is apply. And the thing is, if you've got money in the bank and you don't use it, you know, the biggest thing is we don't, again, have the crystal ball. So is this tough economically for us for six weeks or six months? one year. Like we don't know. So my advice is go get it. If you don't need it, don't use it. Like we don't like, you know, do a complete $200,000 renovation to our studio if we don't need it. Right. So if you're financially, if you've got assets and resources and you can apply, apply. And then if you don't use it six, eight months from now, you haven't need it, write the check, pay it back. <laughs> you know, like just, it's a small interest rate. You might, you're going to pay a couple of interest points on it for the five or six months until you see if you need it and then pay it back if you don't need it. But if God forbid you need it six, seven, eight months from now, you want it in your bank. And, um, you know, if you've got a line of credit, great. I hope you do. Every business should have a line of credit that they just sit there and have. You also, I hope you've got your three to six months rainy day money. Um, but you know, it's the combination of all these things that when you use them in conjunction smartly is going to be your way out of this, no matter how far the downturn takes you. And um, always be in communication with the finance gurus in your life, whether that's your CPA, whether it's a business mentor, um, because I'm giving you general information, but real life, you know, finance information has to be taken account of everything that's your responsibility, that's your asset, that all, it's like a chess game, right? But get all, get all, you know, get all the pieces on your side and then figure out what you need to use and how you're going to use it, right? Yeah. That's good. Now seems like even another good time. I know personally, like getting budgets in order and adjusting some things, it seems like a good time to make sure you're in a good place with that. 100%. Um, so continuing in that conversation with the GPD loss projected up to 30% in the next quarter, uh, this designer asked, how would you speak to the current and prospective clients or to current and respective prospective clients about how the economy will bounce back? Um, I personally, my personally, Luann Nigara. Um, would not even open that conversation with a client unless they put it to my feet. You know, like my thing is you're a grown up. You go figure out your money. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, like what I'm, when I mean by that, it sounds very crass. What I mean by that is if I have found myself fortunate enough to be in a conversation with somebody who possibly wants to buy my products and services, what do I need to start a conversation about the GDP for? Like, what? Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not qualified to talk about it. I, there's no sense making them scared. And what I know is that there are people that have money right now. That's the thing. You know, maybe you are one of those people. Maybe you are one of those people. Maybe you have a, a partner that works for a company that's, maybe you have a partner that works for Zoom for crying out loud. <laughs> like, wah, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, there I are industries that are, you know, making money through this. It's just human nature. It's just industry. It's just the way it is. And so my thing is, is you have to be very careful not to filter this through your personal experience. If mm -hmm. your personal experience is that you have already experienced a significant downturn and maybe your partner, if you've got one, is also in an industry that has had a downturn. You just can't assume the conversation is that way for the other person, right? It's to me, it's no different than assuming like if I'm a raging Yankees fan that everybody I speak to cares about the Yankees. So if somebody were to bring it up to me, right? And say, well, first of all, I find, I guess maybe for large projects like you guys do with, you know, $100,000, $200,000 kitchens and baths and stuff like that. I'm trying to imagine the scenario that that would come up in. And I guess it would come up in, I'm not sure if I'm going to continue the project based on this client, right? It, this climate, I've got it going on, right? So if that were the scenario that we were talking about, I probably in a always respectful, always kind way say just, but, but I would try and get them to tell me if they've actually been affected. Because here's what I'm telling you. My guess is if somebody has a project like that on, on the books with you, on the table with you, and they haven't just said, bye, it's not happening, they've opened up the dialogue, then I'm going to make the quietest assumption that they're just wanting a little push to do it that they're just wanting that little, you're going to still be in business. I'm going to give you my money. It's still going to be okay. And your suppliers are still going to be in business and, you know, just reassure me. Okay. And so that's the tactic I would take because instead of assuming that they wanted me to educate them on the GDP and instead of assuming that they can't afford it, I would make the assumption that if we were talking about a 50, 80, $200,000 project and they were saying, I'm a little concerned about doing in this environment, then I would say, I would start that conversation and down the road, really, what is it that concerns you about it? Because they might say, it might have nothing to do with their, you know, 600 grand in the bank. It might be they're worried about you, hmm. you know? And you can say, hey, I've made these changes. I've, you know, got my staff running lean. I've cut all my expenses. I applied for the SBA loan. I've been meeting with my business coach. I'm coming through this. Like, that's not happening. I'm, I'm not going down. You know what I mean? So I, you know, my thing in sales is, the number one mistake that we make when we try to communicate with our clients and ultimately close a sale is we decide why they've asked the question instead of just really in a gentle, respectful way, keep pulling out why did they ask the question? What do they really want to know from me? Mm. Right. That's good. Not making the assumption now that it's no, but rather feeding into the question and getting more information. Yeah. I just kind of feel like if somebody really can't afford it, they're not asking their interior designer if they should do it. Mm -hmm. They're not. That's good. That's really good. Um, I don't know if this is something you can answer, Louie, but I'm going to read it anyways, and I'll let you tell me. So okay. um, this says, some residential construction is deemed essential due to safety, sanitation, and security. One example is that if a remodel is the client's only home with the only kitchen, it's considered essential. <clears throat> How does this make or not make the interior designer slash kitchen and bath designer essential or non-essential? If I have a project that fits under this category, am I essential because the, um, because the kitchen designer is a source or no? 
Well, it sounds like that you're asking it from a legal standpoint, right? And so I don't have the slightest idea from a legal standpoint to speak to it, but I got to believe that because you can probably do 70% of that process virtually, I would go full steam ahead. Um, if you feel like you want to, I mean, if you go onto your government's website, it will tell you what's essential and what's not. Um, I, you know, I couldn't on New Jersey, it didn't take it past home improvement, but on New York state, it actually said home improvement, including drapery and carpet. Like who would have thought that that like drapes are essential, right? Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm going into New York anytime soon, but <laughs> um, it was, so I think the first thing is if you're really wondering from a technical standpoint, so you don't break the law, then go to where the law is written and find out. Um, but beyond that, you know, there are ways, you know, if somebody really needs a kitchen, my goodness, you're absolutely right. They need a kitchen. They, that's their primary home. It's their only home. They need to be able to do that. So I would just be respectful in the sense of for, to yourself, your staff, and to your client to do as much as you can virtually, and then do as much as you can of, if you really have to be boots on the ground, hey, can you all stand outside? I'll come in. I'll wipe my feet. I'll do my thing. Like, I would, I would, for the most part, I would do as much business as I could in the new way that I could. Yeah, I think that's smart. <clears throat> and I, <clears throat> I can speak to someone on our team had sent out a tracker this morning um, of like tracking to your state and your counties as to like what the rules were specifically for essential versus non-essential. So I know those things are online and on Google that, that you can look for. Good, good. Um, Looking ahead, how do we plan for things when they do open up? Um, I think this is a great question. Like I have several new projects planning to begin in the spring and early summer, but now all of the projects that she was working on um, are on hold and delay. So how do they begin to manage their time schedule? Well, I mean, I think that if a project is on hold or delay, but it's not canceled, I would use the time to make as much movement on that project as possible, right? You know, get all the ducks in a row, get all the sourcing done, get, you know, send the memos back and forth to the people, get the finishes, you know, get as much as you can done, get it ready so that when it's green go, it's boom. It's not like, oh, well, I've been watching Netflix for the last three weeks. Now I got to figure this out, right? So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, you know, and, and the thing is, is that it's to continue to figure out if there's any portion of the project that can be done to completion throughout this. That's a case by case basis. Um, are there other things? If you have a good rapport, you have a good relationship with the client and maybe, maybe you were doing um, you know, a master bedroom, but they had said they wanted to do the kitchen or the bath, which is essential. You know, maybe you can flip them and say, I know we had allotted 50, you know, grand for the master bathroom when we were in the middle of that, but we were going to do the bathroom in the fall or whatever. And if that's going to fa fall under essential, you know, are you interested in changing gears? I change gears with you. Let's do this now and do that then. I mean, my point is don't be afraid to ask as long as you ask nicely, you know, and you're not like, you know, you don't know. Somebody might be like, heck yeah, I forgot. I didn't think, like they're not every day thinking about what our parameters are for essential. That's the thing. So they might be like, oh yeah, that's right. We can do the kitchen because it's essential. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and they might be willing and happy to do it and be glad. Yeah. How would you manage um, an extension to that? Would you kind of push all of your business back a little bit for what you aren't able to do right now and finish those clients as soon as this is over and push back your spring summer projects? Or how would you manage your timeline from that perspective too? No, I would pull that timeline and I would do the evaluation of what can I move along virtually and what can I not? Okay. And anything that I can move along virtually or with how any new construction where you can go if you're not completely on quarantine. But, you know, we measured a project this week where the house is new construction. There's nobody living there. You know what I mean? And the client gave us their garage code to get in 
And so my uh, uh, salesperson could go in, measure 40 windows, have no contact with anybody. She still wore her gloves and booties and all that other stuff. But yeah, I would evaluate all of those things in the timeline and, and, and play chess with them. You know what I mean? And put my energies to anything that I could bring to revenue, that I could bring to a revenue generating situation. That's really good. That's really good. Thank you. Um, shifting gears again. Um, so this question is, how can we retool what we do so we are more prepared should this type of thing ever happen again? So kind of preparing for the future. Well, I think it's, it's kind of like the first question. I think it's going to happen just morphing. I think we're automatically going to start to do things more virtually. And by virtue of doing that, we're looking at different ways to run our business. Um, you know, I mean, we are, re we're working on our website at window works. You know, we've already had, I don't know if it happened yet. It, it um, was on the initiative yesterday, but okay. Every single page, 20 pages of a website that has schedule of uh, in-home shop at home consultation is now changed to schedule a virtual online consultation, right? It's like, and we're adding pages about um, the ways that we can handle a virtual consultation. You know what I mean? So I think that it's just whatever your switch in business is, figure out how you're going to tell your people figure out how you're going to let your consumer base know how you're doing it. And um, for us, that's investing in the website right now and letting people know that, you know, window works will figure it out. I don't know how I'm going to get to the point when it gets to measurements. I'm not worried about that. That's two weeks from now. <laughs> let me, I'm starting with today. You know what I mean? Exactly. What can I do? We're just moving one foot in front of the other. You know what I mean? And we'll figure it out. People will, you know, we'll take a met, they'll take a picture. We'll hold it. They'll hold a tape measure up. You know, um, there are certain products that we each probably can sell. I mean, like when I think about kitchen and bath designers, right? Is there any client out there that has said to you in the last year, you know, I'd love to refresh my kitchen. And the two of you looked at each other and went, you know, new hardware and accessories makes a difference here. I mean, I, you can do new hardware and accessories from the comfort of your home. So, and the thing is, you know, knobs and, you know, cabinets, they're not two bucks. I mean, that could be a couple thousand dollar sale. Mm -hmm. All the difference between making payroll this week for yourself or not, right? So I would think about those types of things. Or, you know, when that person said that to you maybe two or three months ago, you're like, oh, sweet Jesus, I do not have time to just pick new hardware for you and tchotchkes for your countertop. <laughs> but guess what? You do now. And that customer, that client is there every single day in that blasted kitchen now going, I wish I had updated this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm saying like dig deep, bring $2,000 in this week. That's huge. Yeah. Even if like you're supposed to, you know, my cost to be open is over 200 K a month. But if I close a $2,000 sale today, I'm like, yes. You can't overlook any opportunity now. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's really good. Mm -hmm. um, this is a fun question, and maybe everyone can send in their um, their favorites on the chat feature. But uh, this designer asks, "What are some of your favorite apps or programs to get information into the hands of your clients without actually seeing them in person?" So we know Zoom. Zoom works yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, we haven't leaned into it so much that I can tell you there's a level of sophistication happening on our part yet. And you know me, I'm tech challenged to begin with. So, I mean, so far we've done FaceTime and we've done Zoom. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, we haven't, those are the two that we've done. So I don't know what else is coming down the pike and that's not my, <laughs> you don't want to ask me tech questions. You really don't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I see some people sitting in there, so this is awesome, and we can always share. Yeah, stuff. I would say Laurel is a huge tech person. Have her put something in the chat. She probably knows something I don't know. I know. I mean, for heaven's sake, she's at the bowling alley right now, so she. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know that you need a lot more than than Zoom or FaceTime, truthfully, to have an effective consultation. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. One I can see right now says that they've been tapping into their, their newsletter list. And I think that's a good thing. That's something that we're 
doing also is, hey, what information can we send out and just to keep all of us educated during this time. So um, the bloggers and the, the newsletters, I think is a great a great yeah. idea. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I'm seeing a lot of people saying MailChimp. Of course, we use Active Campaign, and we are. We created a big blog post this week that's going out to our email list, all about that concept of awnings. That you know, it's going to be July in in New Jersey, and it's going to be gross. And you're going to be in your house and you're going to wish you had an awning to sit under. You know, now that was all inside voice. We didn't say it nearly as, you know, straightforward as that. But, you know, letting them know that you're spending more time in your home and let's make your outdoor space something that you have a great time with this summer. You know? Yeah, that's good. Um. Okay, so this designer, this company says that they're looking for opportunities to grow their business. I'm sure that's a common theme right now. Um, she's, they said, if I'm looking at products to develop, what are some key factors I must consider? Well, the most obvious that comes to mind, right, is any kind of e-commerce uh, platform. But, you know, I'm just going to tell you. Developing an e-commerce platform is like being a kitchen and bath designer and saying, I'm going to open a bowling alley. Like it is a whole nother business. Okay. Now it might relate because you're going to sell all the wonderful, pretty things on there, but don't underestimate that it is opening up a, an, an entirely new business. However, if that is, if that aligns with you, that fits with you, that fits your future, future goals, then yeah, all, all the better. Lean into it now. But it's a lot of money to develop a tech platform like that. And um, it does require a different skill set. And it does require a different set of either employees or virtual um, consultants. And uh, But that would be a totally amazing thing that if you were inclined to do that, that I would say lean into that. Beyond that, it's really just, look, whatever you do has to be right for you. Because like maybe e-design is an easier obstacle mm -hmm. to overcome, right? But if you don't like e-design, then, you know, maybe you'll do it for the short run, right? But I don't know that I would invest, like WindowWorks is going to, we're investing all of this now in rebuilding and, and adding new pages for the website for virtual consultations. You know, I had, like I said, two colleagues yesterday said that I'm always going to offer this. I'm not going back. I don't know how we're going to do yet, right? But so I'm, I'm investing enough money at this point so that I can attract some consultation so that I can keep some revenue coming in. But personally, I'm not called in our company that we are shifting our mission and vision of WindowWorks to be a virtual design um, company. So there's that balance of, yeah, lean in and put some money and dollar bills behind it in order to bridge the gap, but I'm not like, and full hog. So that's the thing. It's like, if you've always secretly been like, yeah, I would love to do e-design and that's really what I want to do. I want to design from the Maldives, you know what I'm saying? Then, but I've been too busy running a business and dealing with every single client that I've got in my eyeballs. Well then, right, lean in, go there now. But I don't want you to lean into something because somebody said it was a way to make money. It has to be true for you. You have to want to do it, right? Because every day, if you don't work in your passion, it's going to be very hard to go through tough times. Mm -hmm. And this is a crazy tough time, but there's another tough time coming around the corner. I'm telling you, you know? Yeah, that's good. Also feel like it's a time that you can, you can try things and you might, you might end up liking something that you didn't think that you would. Now it's right. the opportunity. Right. Right. And I haven't really been able to keep up with the comments here because I can't talk and read and look and all at the same time, but I did just check, catch Michelle's comment about don't offer e-design services too cheap. Be careful not to dilute your brand. This is, this, I agree with this a hundred percent. So um, the thing is that you, there are, you have your lane. Don't necessarily leave your lane right? So if your lane is that you are a $350 an hour designer, well, you're not an $85 an hour e-designer. 
okay? Maybe you're not a $350 an hour e-designer either, but you got to mix that combination there that you still are in your lane. And my thing is always to wherever I can keep the price as in line with my brand, my lane as much as possible. And when um, somebody wants a little more or a little extra or a little something off, I'm more inclined to give more value so that I justify the charge I'm at. Okay. So um, I like that little caveat there, Michelle. Good on you. Great. So this is a little unique, but this designer is co-writing a book targeting mid higher end developers that can lead to new clients and speaking engagements. From a, des a design business, what is one key factor they should address in this book? It's whatever your superpower is. I can't give you my superpower. You can't write about it, right? Not nobody, you, what, it, what do you bring to the table? If you're an interior designer writing a book for high-end property developers, what's different about you? What is, what, what is different about your view on interior design that makes their life better, easier, more profitable? And because the thing is, every single one of us could write that chapter in that book. And we'd potentially all have a different point of view on what it is. So you have to, you have to lean into why are they reading this book by you? Not like what's all the design advice I could give because that's too big. That's too broad. It's why did you write this book? What do you know about prop, the relationship between property developers and interior designers that is so powerful to you that you are compelled to write a book about it? Because if you're just writing a book because you think it's a good marketing idea, not a great idea, okay? You have to bring, like I wrote a book, right? The Making of a Well-Designed Business. The book is Business 101. It is literally, it is, here's the, the, the target reader for this book. Somebody who has not run a business yet and wants to know like, okay, before I open a business, you know, I start with step one and I go step two and I go all through 10 chapters and I have my foundation for a business. It's also for the person that's been running a business five, eight, 10 years and hasn't been making money. And they're sick and tired of running the hamster mill of why do I keep robbing Peter to pay Paul? Well, I guarantee you there's a step in there that they've missed or a couple. Okay. But did the world need another business book? I mean, did the world need another business book? Like Google it in Amazon. It's like 40,000 answers. But this business book was, I, was literally what I believed were the secret sauce to the success of our, at, the, at then, then point, 36 year old company. And I was compelled to say, this is what worked for us. This is exactly how it worked for us. If it will work for you, great. So it wasn't like, what are the things that business people need to know about running a business? It was like, what do I know about running a business that I think would be helpful to somebody else? So this designer has to lean in. What do I know as a designer that would be helpful to a developer? Why would a developer read this and say to his friend, you got to read this book? And I don't know what that answer is because I don't know what that designer's superpower is. Interesting. That's good. Okay. Um, I like this question. I feel like a lot of people could potentially be here, but this specific designer decided to move um, on March 1st um, decided to move from their 200 square foot showroom to a new 600 square foot space that will accommodate them and their team. Um, renovations have begun and continued slowly with just one person doing the work. So a question is, should I plow full steam ahead furnishing the space with all the expensive cabinet displays I plan for or do I take it slow and as business comes in buy a little at a time? I know you kind of spoke to this about your personal experience, but um, yeah, I think that answer is really going to depend on um, their cash on hand, their access to cash, whether it's through a line of credit. Um, I don't think I would put into that mix the SBA loan 
You know what I mean? Like, I think that, um, you know, look, there are five people I could line up and get all their details. I'd be like, pull that plug, baby, if you can. And there would be five people I would say, hey, you know what? Manage it, manage that cash flow, monitor it. Don't like go crazy pants on it. But yeah, go ahead. You're going to come through. So I really do think that that's probably a question for their, um, their financial advisors, you know, for their CPA or whoever their business and their financial mentors are, because that's going to require an evaluation of, you know, all of their assets on hand. How many months out do they have their liquid assets on hand for? What is the projected investment? What is their projected pipeline um, based on what's happening in their current business right now? And also, um, you know, the risk if they pull back. So can they even get out of that lease now? Or are they tied to that, that, that lease and those rent payments, whether they're in or they're out? Um, the other thing is that I would not, um, not explore the possibility of going to the landlord and saying, dude, you know, you're going to give me a couple minutes here. You know, you got to give me a couple of months here, you know, because I'm going to hang on, but you got to give me a minute to breathe and give me, you know, give me half rent for the next three months or give me no rent for two months and half rent for the, like, don't be afraid to ask. That's all I'm saying. If you really need it, don't be afraid to ask because depending on the position of that landlord, he may be just thrilled to have half rent for the next three months and have you say, okay, then I'm gone, right? So, um, you know, the idea is that, again, with a negotiation like that, I would go with kindness, I would go with, um, you know, honesty, and I would, you know, I would not go, there would not be a hard line negotiation. It would be like, look, I signed this lease with you. I'm looking forward to this, everything about this, you know, I want. Um, but I'm going to ask you to have my back for a couple of months. And, you know, I'm going to always remember it and be grateful, like whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. Humility goes far. Um, in addition, they've redesigned their logo and mounting a rebrand campaign. Um, I know your answer to this, Luann, but sh they're asking, do I lay low on this? Full steam ahead. Full mm -hmm. steam ahead. That's full steam ahead. Come out of this strong, who you are, start to tell everybody, you know, this is what we're doing. This is who we are. That's all, you know, there's a certain amount of costs attached to that, I'm sure. So, you know, with, if you're working with a marketing department, a marketing company or a web development company or a branding company, um, maybe you, um, you monitor that a little bit if you're, particularly if the landlord is going to like drive a hard line with you or something like that. But you, you can full steam ahead in social and all of that stuff. I would definitely do that. Monitor it financially, but mentally it's full steam ahead. Love it. Yeah. So this question is um, actually from a manufacturer draft down in Florida, but um, kind of switch gears. And this is our last question before we'll go to the chat line. But they're asking, is there still an opportunity to call on new customers and generate leads during this time? They want to be, they don't want to be inconsiderate or seem awkward by cold calling new customers. Um, so do you have any advice on the best way to approach these type of calls? Yeah, it's the same thing. Don't assume that somebody isn't doing business or interested in doing business. Think about this. This is one of your reps that is wondering if they should call on you. Meanwhile, we're all scrambling to keep our businesses going. So this rep has to think about what can he or she do for his potential clients? How, how, what, can he or she call up and say, hey, I just want to be helpful to you. Are there... Do I, can I increase your library so that you have more things to show? Can you not get to your local, you know, design studios, you know, design, um, uh, you know, the merchandise mart and different things. Can I give you, can I ship you a, a library of books? Can I give you samples? Tell them that you can order samples. I'll send them out at FedEx. Like we're all trying to keep our businesses going. If a rep shows up and gives you four different ways he can help you keep your businesses going, we're like, yay, thank you. So that's what this rep has got to do. Like, it's not like, hi, I'm here and I have no sales and I really could use a sale. What can you do for me lately? It's like, no, 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 no. Hey, you know, 
you're in my territory. Maybe we've never spoken before. Maybe I've never gotten a chance to introduce myself to you before, but these are the products and the lines that I rep. And I want you to know any way I can support you in this by sending samples, sending, you know, videos of our product. If, if you know a way, tell it to me all day long. If you're not sure, just know I'm here and ask because if I can do it, I'll do it. Absolutely. That's really good. Awesome. Well, I'm going to pass it over to Alex. She's been reading and moderate, monitoring the chat. So, um, Alex, can you hand yeah. it in on over? Yeah, absolutely. I'll start with the first question here, Luann. So the first one says, do you think owners will become more com comfortable purchasing expensive, complicated goods online? For example, sinks, tile, and appliances. I do think so. I think that's going to be part of the outcome of this. It's, um, I think that I think there's always going to be a space for you guys to do what you do at the luxury level in the home again. There's no question. But I think, I mean, think about, here's the, look, I, again, crystal ball, no, don't have it. But I just think about some of the experiences that I'm having as a human being that are different. So a month ago, if you said to me that I was not going to see any of my three grandchildren for two weeks, I would have told you, you were out of your mind. I would have said, that's ridiculous because I go, I go running off to their houses two or three times a week for a half hour for a hug and a goodbye. And now all of a sudden, you know, FaceTime and watching Instagram stories has, it's like two weeks later, it's almost like normal. Like, like, like okay, what's Lucy doing? What's Bella doing? So there is going to be this new normal. And if you can continue to communicate with your clients, the ones that you have and the ones that you hope to have in a way that continues to show them, you know, we, I can, I can show you the picture of the way this tile looks out, you know, laid out. And then I can send the sample to you for you to get it in the mail. And then we can talk about it again. Like that happens once that happens twice. That happens three times. Like, all of a sudden, think about if you have a busy, you know, executive in a corporation this time next March, and you're like, hey, got to get together and pick that tile. I mean, I can hear that woman saying, can't we just do it on FaceTime? Because it has become a way for them. So it's, I don't think it will replace it. But yeah, I do think it's going to change. And what, there's, I, even like I said to these people, the, the women that in our industry, window treatment industry, she just said, I did nine appointments in four days. Like I didn't have to drive. I didn't have to do, you know, it gets just so much more efficient. So um, yes, I do think that people will gradually get more comfortable making higher ticket purchases virtually. Um, but I don't think it will replace it. I mean, you still have to go do your magic and in, in person and paint the picture, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so it doesn't look like there's really any more questions. There's just a lot of comments about, you know, e-design um, and what, what, what uh, platforms to use, like Google Slides and so forth. So, and MailChimp, which we mentioned before. Um, so since there's really not any other questions, is there any other last words of advice or wisdom that you would give Luann to this group? Yeah, hang in there. It, everything will be okay eventually. Um, but on the road to being okay, be absolutely brutal with your operating expenses. If you haven't already, this is the time. Fine tooth comb. Go through, get rid of anything you don't need, okay? Um, you know, it's so crazy. Little crazy things. We pay the um, health club memberships for our employees. I have one employee that I said to him two months ago, you know, what's the deal with X, Y, Z and X, Y, Z? He's like, oh yeah, no, no, I'm not going to that one anymore. I'm like, okay, you need to cancel it. My husband looks at the credit card statement this morning. He's like, why do I have this? Like, he just, he got busy. He didn't do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, and so that's a $330, you know, bill that month. You know what I mean? That's like on the thing. And it's like, so my point is be intentional, go through everything in your business and really cut to bare essentials. That's number one. And then number two, be creative. 
figure out ways to meet your consumer where they are. Do not be afraid to help them. Do not be afraid to market to them. You know, the thing is, there's a lot of people that have this feeling like they want to support their local businesses. They want their world to come back. And so you're part of that local world, that, that business world that they want to come back. So don't be afraid to let them help you get through it. Okay. Um, you know, it's funny because it'll come out on the podcast in a, a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, probably about five or six weeks from now. But I just interviewed the, the woman yesterday and she's not in our industry. And so it's a Power Talk Friday episode. But she shared, and I thought it was so genius. She shared. Now, you have to think, figure out your twist for your industry. But she shared that one of her coaching clients is a hairdresser or is the client of a hairdressing studio. I don't know which one it was, but it's not relevant. The point is that this hairdresser in Florida has looked up the dye formula for every single one of her clients and she has put together a care package with the gloves their mixture of dye you know a little cap uh you know i think she put a candle in it or something and she just went around and dropped it on the front door of each of her clients now, I'm not wearing a baseball cap for no reason here, okay? <laughs> like, you know, I mean, like legit, like I open up my door and my hairdresser has done this. And the thing is, what I know is there's hairdressers out there that would say to themselves, well, that's such a blatant attempt to market to them. I shouldn't do that. No, ma'am, that's a great gesture. And by the way, it's an amazing marketing attempt because am I going to make sure that I go to this lady? So for you guys, what is it? Is there somebody that was talking about upgrading their hardware or changing it out? Do you put a little bag together that's two or three hardware samples? And, you know, I don't know. I don't know kitchens and baths. But don't be afraid to say, you know what? I realize you're probably in the house every day with your kids. Maybe you're up to eyeballs in fifth grade math. And I thought you might want to dream about, you know, the, the products and things that we thought we were going to put in your kitchen. Let me know if you want to start with the hardware. It's something we can do. Like, you guys know better than me, but don't not do that. So cut your expenses, be smart with your money, get your loans in order, get your financial assets in order, but get your thinking caps on and keep connecting to your clients. <laughs> That's my advice. <laughs> All right, you guys, are, you're on mute, Alex. I just unmuted you, Elise. Oh, okay, sorry. I was trying to talk. Um, this has been awesome. And when a person is asking. Oh, she's frozen. Or is, am I frozen too or just Elise? No, Elise is frozen. There, Elise is frozen. Um, but there was one more question if you wouldn't mind answering. <laughs> That's about time. Okay, great. Let me just ask you really quickly here. It was, are people still doing installs? Um. That's a benefit of having that network, just like this. Um, we have had some of our colleagues tell us that they are doing installs and they're doing the whole, um, you mentioned it at the top, calling to make sure that no one's sick and you know that sort of thing, the way Monogram is doing their installs, but they're coming in with, um, you know, coming into the house and putting booties on and having gloves and visibly, one of the things one of our colleagues is doing and he's making for all of us in in our uh, group of 70 80 window treatment professionals he has a um solar shade manufacturing facility and he's taking um solar shade material and he's cutting it into three by two pieces and he's having in uh graphic on it you know toolbox drill you know, blah, 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 you know, you know, this is the safe zone. So that when an installer walks in the house, you know, the, and, and it says we wipe this down before and after every appointment. So when installer walks in the house and he puts that down, you know, the 
client is automatically picking up. This isn't any old random thing. This is an extra measure. So um, we there are ways and people have been doing it. Our team has not yet. Our installers are not comfortable with it and they don't want to, um, but we have done outside installs um, in the last two weeks. And um, we probably, the more this goes on, will navigate that. I think that's a very personal thing um, with you and your particular team or you and your um, trade vendor, your, your, your contractor, because, you know, it's not the kind of thing that if you press somebody to do something and they're uncomfortable, you know, the consequences could be nothing or they could be dramatic. So for us, we're choosing not to insist. So, yeah, thank you. Y'all, thank you so much for being here. This has been so much fun. It's been good to see everyone's faces out there. Um, so thank you, Luann. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. This was awesome. Such great advice. So we really appreciate it. And I know this, this won't be our last one. So next week, uh, right? We're doing it again. Yes. Thank you for saying that. Such a good reminder. So we are sending it out today, but Luann and my Doma are doing a 19 hours Luann, I'm going to let you talk about this because you can do much better than I will. <laughs> okay. If you haven't heard about it yet, um, you've got to go to mydomastudio.com forward slash one nine hours. And it's a free event. You don't have to be a MyDoma Studio user. Um, and we have put together content starting this coming Monday. We are doing presentations 11, 1, and 3, Monday through Thursday. And both Tuesday and Thursday, we have... Um, five o'clock presentations as well. Um, and so what we're doing is a lot of the events that my Doma studio, myself, uh, Kravit, J poor living, uh, monogram summer classics that we all had planned for high point. It was kind of like, well, what happens to all that? That was all that great stuff. So we've just organized to do it all in four days with three or four presentations a day. And so there'll be solo presentations at 11 and three o'clock. Um, but at one o'clock every day, I'm going to lead the panel discussions that I was scheduled to lead in high point and i'm telling you what there is just such a killer lineup so monday is an influencers plant panel and it's got kristen woodson harvey kate o'hara and dina holland from honey and fits um, on tuesday we have um a whole conversation about different levels of services and how to package your services and how to quantify them so that it makes it easier to sell. And that's with Dixie Willard, Sarah Brennan, and Mimi Goldsmith. And then on Wednesday, we have, we all rise together. And I've got three sets of duos that have been either peer mentors to each other or truly mentor mentee as far as information and experience in business. So I've got Cheryl Luckett, Rashida Gray, uh, Jenny Slingerland, Brittany Simon, and Kat French and Alfie um, Roman. And then Thursday, my God, Thursday, I have Sandra Funk, Toby Fairley, Monica Wilcox, and um, Tracy Connell. And these are all four high-end, very experienced, seasoned interior designers that are also coaching designers. And so we're going to talk about the, the cross-section of the must-to business principles, the must non-negotiable business principles that each of these women agree is the result of um, you know, the foundation for their success. And then three o'clock on Thursday, we're doing a monogram thing again, um, solo with me. And um, five o'clock, we're going to have all the speakers on the screen and we're going to have, um, you know, just a fun wind down and have a glass of wine or whatever you want to have with you. And so um, it's free. You can come to all of it live. You can get the recording afterwards, but it's like, you know, information on steroids. It's going to be outstanding. I like, like literally cannot wait. So would love for have to have all of you join us. That's awesome. Yes, and Monogram is one of the sponsors of that. So huge thank you to you to helping us to put that together. Yeah, we're super excited to be a part of it and um, just a continuation of uh, what we've been talking about today. So 
um, it's not a goodbye to see you later. And we're looking forward to seeing all you guys next week and um, continuing to see you virtually. So thank you so much, Louie. And thank you everybody for joining. And uh, we will send out the link and video um, later this afternoon. So you can rewatch this um, and pretend like we're all together again. So we'll see y'all later. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.